put off by how long this video is. Don't worry, I try to jam pack my videos with as much content and as much detail as I possibly can. Anything I feel I can comment on and that I feel you might be interested in, I pretty much put in the video. I try not to repeat myself and talk fairly fast. If the video is too long for you, I have recorded a shorter version and the link will be in the description box. American Psycho Movie Review It's the 1980s. Patrick Bateman works on Wall Street. I'm not entirely sure what he works, what, what, his, what he does when he works, we never actually see him work, but he is a vice president at Pearson Pierce. And that's the important thing. He and his colleagues lack depth. They see success as the be all end all, as the goal of everything. They spend a lot of money going to expensive restaurants, doing coke, among other things having sex with secretaries, you know, friends, friends of friends, you know, various, you know, prostitutes, escorts, and this completely independently of their actual monogamous relationship. To be fair, their, you know, their partners appear to know so, and Patrick himself is coming to realize how banal and gratuitous it is. It's, they, they're like spoilt children. They do what they want, when they want it, how they want it, and they don't have to work for anything. Several of them might not even particularly have to you know, have to have proven themselves to be where they are. They might have connections with, you know, within the field. And Patrick, as such, is not satisfied. He is going through the motions, even if his fellow vice presidents of Pierce and Pierce, to, to quote, I believe it's the IMDb fact, the fact that all of them are vice presidents, you know, all of these, there's like maybe half a dozen who are vice presidents would suggest that it is not a particularly unique or, you know, important position if, if so many different ones can all be, yes. And as such, he is getting into more and more risky, violent, even murderous behavior, including sexually. And as we know, idle hands are the devil's playthings and matters are further complicated when there is an investigation of someone that he has targeted. This does not necessarily have an awful lot of plot. It's essentially a series of situations that are common to these characters. You know, not much necessarily happens or changes or develops. It's, you know, it's a series of days in the lives of these people, especially from the perspective of Patrick. And it has the very compelling effect of making us feel what Patrick feels, that this is in, indeed banal, that this is just a never-ending, there's, there's no, it's gonna sound like the movie's bad, the movie's amazing, but their situations, there's no build-up. The, the very first thing we see is them at this extravagant restaurant. There's no, there's no getting there. They're there. They've been there for as long as they can remember, and they're probably going to be there for a lot more. Th these are, you know, these these are yuppies. The they're, you know, 
20 somethings and they're already about at the top you know there's there's nowhere else to really go so they're just passing the time doing everything they want and yeah that that gets old and the I have watched the sequel to this it's atrocious and you should never watch it I have not read the novel nor anything else by Brett Easton Ellis though as far as I understand this has been toned down from the novel you know some elements have been removed but it is an overall faithful adaptation making changes only to fit the the length and the medium of feature film and it clearly gets the original and that is really all we can ever hope for with an adaptation maybe especially from you know a book to a film I don't think I've particularly watched anything else by this director Mary Heron but I you know as far as I can tell she's done a lot of TV episodes and short films and such she wrote the script along with writer actress Guinevere I think Turner and they they're both a little disappointed with their own work on the ending of the film in that it suggests something that they really didn't mean it to and I will go into that in the thoughts video some have said that the second half of this is bad the second half is different and it is it's it's difficult to keep delivering it's it's the the setup and the build up that is that's that's where if you're really skilled you can get a lot of really good material in because people are just come going in they don't necessarily know exactly what is going to happen so you have their attention and anything you tell them basically if if you're doing it right they are hanging on your every word and it is more difficult to keep the the you know yeah the the later you know acts and such of it's different but i wouldn't say it's worse it it needed to be the, the movie couldn't have kept going the way it was for the first half the you know it is maybe one of those movies where it is a movie of two halves much like the the full metal jacket where um, I'm not sure I should give away for anyone who hasn't watched that movie but yeah movies of two halves and this one they're they're both really solid but you will you will notice that the things really change and I'd say it's a good way I'd say it both sets up all these situations and characters and such and follows through gives us something that really feels like a satisfying yeah con conclusion if not I'm not sure if you would use the word climax but I can in in a way yes and I, I'm afraid I will have to agree with the director and fellow writer that the the ending seems to suggest something that they they were well aware that that wasn't the idea that that shouldn't be but you know sometimes you're just not quite happy with the you know your your work of creative expression and un unfortunately it does but it is clearly still there in the film what they actually meant and it just requires you to pick up those clues and to think it through and I mean this this is a movie that you'll wanna talk about with other people you will wanna go online you wanna see what others have made of it you know and in so you will 
I'd say most people will probably come to the conclusion that the director writer wanted them to, even if they don't read their quotes about it. But yeah, it's a the the very conclusion is immensely satisfying. It is just about pitch perfect. But some of the things that just immediately preceded are not quite as, yeah, it, yeah, I'd, I'd say the, the director writer really covered that rather well. Now, I am basing my review on the R-rated version, and I, I, I'm aware that there are other versions. In part, it's because this is the copy that I got not long after it came out. This is actually, I, I was not always that good in, at analysis. I have not had in, enough of, like, varied experiences, known that many different types of people and such. So there was a while where, you know, to, to quote, Captain America, internet, so helpful. I now have a much broader perspective and have had that for maybe last five years or so. So, you know, when I, about when I started recording videos was when I really started to get a hold of a handle on these things. But me and a friend of mine, a Yes, we, you know, I had gotten this very soon after it came out. I don't remember exactly why, but I had, and he and I watched it, and we watched it dozens of times. And we couldn't necessarily put words to these different things or explain why they were significant, but we watched it, we watched the deleted scenes, which I definitely recommend. If if you have a copy that doesn't have them or whatever, I believe they are on YouTube. I don't really want to, I don't know, is is that legal? I mean, they're not technically, I mean, the movie obviously would not be legal to watch for free online, but the deleted scenes, I don't know, but, you know, they are available for certain and they are excellent and they really help. And and from from reading the again the the IMDb the fact and trivia, I can tell that a lot of what's in the book is in these deleted scenes. And yeah, it you know they they are the good kind of deleted scenes, the kind where you're like, yeah, this works. It's too bad it was cut. And yeah, he and I would talk about every single little detail, little every angle, every little look, every line, the words used, and all these things. And yeah, and and this is the first time I've watched it in years. I don't remember, but it's probably yeah, it's probably been at least those five years since yeah, and a lot of it I was recognizing, and a lot of it really had a much greater impact. I could always tell this was an excellent movie, but I didn't always have the words to express why. I couldn't always connect why these scenes and these looks and such are so, so inspired. Because I didn't quite, I, I didn't know enough about Wall Street and yuppies and such. And, yeah, it's... And that brings me to... This went through a bit of a development period. And at different times, pa Patrick could have been played by Billy Crudup, Johnny Lee Miller... Jared Leto, who is in this, but not as, not as Patrick. And at, 
for a while it was off a script Ellis wrote himself. And Stuart Gordon could have directed, which is quite interesting. I, I do, I have to admit, I have not watched that much Stuart Gordon, but what little I have watched, I'm, I know for certain that I watched Fortress, and that is an amazing movie, a pure B-movie, and just action, sci-fi, body horror, you know, really just, and that's that again is a movie that my friend and I watched a ton of times. We didn't have so much trouble understanding that one, but we loved it, and yeah, but, but most of what I know about Stuart Gordon and most of my appreciation of him I base on Deus Deacon's excellent reviews. I don't, Deus, De, I, I don't know exactly how it's to be pronounced, but he is here on YouTube, you know, D-E-U-S, uh, D-E-A-C-O-N, I think, something like that. And yeah, he's, he's reviewed the entire, you know, the, the Clive Barker, yeah, with, with, with Pinhead. And, you know, he's reviewed that entire series. So just look up those reviews, you'll definitely find him. But yeah, the, Stuart Gordon would have made, would have done some very interesting with, with this. It would almost definitely have been more gruesome. Give, again, given he's, you know, his body horror is quite, yeah, it, it would have been interesting. I, um, I tend to be of the opinion I wouldn't mind. I know it's probably not going to happen, rights and all this kind of stuff. I would like to see the the movie that he would have made, for example. And, you know, I think it might have been with him that Johnny Depp was attached to play Bateman. And David Cronenberg was attached to, to do this, although he would have made significant changes. But again, I would like to see his, you know, I, I don't know maybe the, you know, un, unfilmed script is, yeah, Bruce, get on that one. It's probably online or something, but yeah. And Brad Pitt could have played Bateman, which, you know, you might think really, but yeah. given Fight Club, I think he could have been interesting in the role. Leo DiCaprio could have played it, and Edward Norton, Ewan McGregor, others as well, but those are the ones I know and where I can actually get an idea of what it might be. Edward Norton certainly would have been interesting as well, but I'm really glad that it is Christian Bale. Oliver Stone could have done this, which would also have been interesting. I'm not sure he would have quite fit. And Danny Boyle, and given train train spotting, I could see that that could have been quite interesting. The whole psychological element, but yeah, and Martin Scorsese, which. Again, would have been interesting. I'm not sure it would quite have, but yeah, it's so it it definitely there were a lot of interesting people involved with you know developing this. This has a great cast. You know, Christian Bale, Jared Leto, Josh Lucas, Justin Theroux, I want to say, so, you know, Chloe Sevigny, Reese Witherspoon, Samantha Mathis, just incredibly talented people and all superbly cast. I, I don't think I've ever seen, I guess, I'm not sure I've seen any of these people in something where I didn't like them, where I didn't think, and you know, some people don't like his Batman or, or his Bruce Wayne, I I don't know, I, I'm i not well read enough in Batman to say, but I tend to at least really like him, I'm, I'm not gonna say that he's like the best Batman, the best Batman voice is obviously Kevin Conroy, I, you know, I'm, I'm not that you know, utterly ignorant about the character, but 
yeah, is I I can't say for sure which you know if he's where he ranks compared to the other moves, except of course for Clooney. Clooney, I love Clooney, but not as not as Batman. Some have said that the characters are kind of cliche, and as a result, the film itself is as shallow as the people it portrays. I disagree. It's that the the characters part of it is that this film is not really meant to be taken as realism. It's very close, like like you know, the the various like interactions between people at most times seems to be like how people talk more or less you know not necessarily the most interesting people talk like this but yeah you know you, you there are people who talk like this but there are also events and characters and such that are just kind of I don't know if absurd is too strong a term, but just you're not supposed to look at this and say this is, you know, this this person, I, I understand every aspect of them. And, and some will say that this makes the movie worse. I disagree. But when you look at these people, the thought that should be, you know, is... This is something that some people actually want. This is something that, you know, some, some people look at, for example, the, them doing all these, you know, expensive things, doing all this, these, these things, they do what they want. Some people are going to look at that. And w we are supposed to look at that and laugh and say, that's ridiculous. That's, and, and they're clearly, they're not satisfied. There, there are these sudden angry you know i i timed it the first time patrick says something extremely violent and ugly to another person and it gets no response it's less than five minutes in and that's after i mean the opening you know with with like the the, the opening titles and such I didn't quite time that, I, maybe a minute and a half or something, so the movie has barely begun before the first time he reacts in a vicious way to another person and, and just with them right there. It's not like he walks into another room and says, Ugh. you know, he just, I mean, it's, it's not a spoiler, it's a bartender and he's just ordered and she turns around and he says it, but I mean, there's, there's a mirror there. She can see him talking to her and hey there's there's music he's talking relatively she might be able to hear at least the fact at least the tone she might not be able to tell the words but she can she should be able to tell this guy is being absolutely atrocious just the way he's talking to me another human being and and this isn't a situation i you know he's talking to me as if he just found, you know, I don't know, his old high school bully or something. He's just being ridiculous. And, and there's nothing, there's nothing that would make this reasonable. I, I don't remember the exact exchange, but I think there's something about, yeah, I think it's that they don't, they no longer take credit cards. It's a cash only bar, she says. And she turns around and he responds like this because how can she not take a credit card? It's a credit. It's a credit card. Everybody takes credit cards. Do you know who I am? It's it's that kind of thing, you know. It's just this. Yeah, and and this the the whole movie has this kind of behavior. I'm I'm gonna go more into that, but just you know that that is in relation to whether or not they are, you know cliche. I'd, I'd say that some of the characters don't get to have a lot. We, we don't see them in that many situations, but 
Patrick and others. Obviously Patrick, because we spend the movie with him. But other characters, I, sh I don't... I shouldn't say, but yeah, there, there are other major characters who do react in very significant ways to different situations. And yeah, it's, it's a, yeah, I th think I've covered that. Now, others have already drawn comparisons between Bateman and Dexter. And one, one thing that should definitely be, that, that I will definitely go into, is the, the introduction of this. Is this very sinister, playful kind of thing. The, you should almost go into this blind. I, I actually, I, I was about to say, I, I, you know, oh, if you could go into this the first time, I distinctly remember, me and my friend, I mean, we probably watched the trailer. We, we, you know, I tend to watch trailers before I watch movies to, to get myself in that mindset to say, okay, this is, this is the kind of movie. We still didn't know quite what, to, you don't know what to expect from this movie. If you, until you watched every minute of it, you don't know what to expect. It, it just, it keeps, that's, that's also something I'm going to go into more, but yeah, you, you really don't know. It, it completely turns at times, but, but the very opening, the very first thing you see is this white background and then this drop of blood and more. And each time there's this note that plays and it, it starts out as this, you know, you're, you're, you feel like you're, you're about to watch like you know some some a horror movie about a mass murder and in a way you are but it's this i mean you you might expect something like that from and i it's been too long since i've watched 7 but i feel like that one has a more overt introduction but but one of these more subtle introductions where just these these hints that this person is unhinged you know but and yeah just one drop another drop and then suddenly you know a, a knife gets raised and chops down and it chops into I don't know exactly but it might just be like pork and then it's like a a berry that falls across but there's so much blood, it's, that's not blood. And you see where it's landing. I don't know exactly what it is because I would never eat at a restaurant like this, but it's some kind of like side sauce or something. And it's being like, if you imagine the, the, the plate, it's being spread in this pattern and you see everything is just arranged. I mean, you don't, you don't know if to, if you don't know, she, you, you're looking at this at this meal, and you're not sh should I should I eat that, or should I hang it on a wall maybe because it looks it looks like a piece of art, and that's what these people eat. That's what it's not in the movie, but there's apparently a a part of the novel where they you know one of them has just spoken has just been you know, had lunch with a client and they were so confused because the client just had chicken, just grilled chicken and, you know, and Bateman asks, what shape was it cut into? And and that's because they don't live in that world. They, they live in this other world where they can just do whatever they want, where food looks like art. And to us, you know, to, to the non-yuppie viewer, that's, that's how this, 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 it's such a good intro because it starts as this, that's that's so much blood. This is awful. And then suddenly you're looking at food. Immediately the movie connects these two things. This lifestyle where they're eating this stuff that to us looks like art. And and just you know, and, and which does start out looking like blood, you know, very intentionally. And then this you know, brutal violence. It's it's immediately 
connecting the two subtly. It's, you know, it's, it's not a newspaper article that says, you know, Wall Street exec found with, you know, found near bloody corpse with a knife in his hand, you know. It's just subtly with, with imagery suggesting, you know, because again, a few minutes after we've seen this blood is actually this artsy food, we see Bateman make this horrible threat to this essentially stranger. You know, I've, this is the kind of thing where if you or I walked into a bar and we said something like that to the bartender, they would call the police. We would, not even just the bouncer, they would call the police and we'd be like, just, but, I mean, like, like I said, do, do you know who I am? I'm, I'm, I'm more important than this, you know, and it's this, I will, I will also get more into, to that, but there, there is a, an awful lot to cover with, with this. Yes, the, the introduction thus has this very sardonic quality to it, and you know, I guess Dexter began in like 06, so five years after this. Dexter similarly in its intro connects violence with, you know, a, a excuse me, a lifestyle. But in Dexter it is just average people because it's not, you know, he's just, he's just making breakfast, you know, eggs, and he's pressing, I guess, an orange, or it might be like, yeah, you know, and he's, you know, tying his shoes, just everyday, you know, blue collar kind of just, you know, this is what we do when we get up in the morning, and making that seem violent, and thus, you know, Dexter, who lives a fairly ordinary life, is also very violent. So it there's you know, and then we do of course have. Yeah, I guess it isn't a spoiler. There's one point where Dexter does indeed use, because he uses a number of aliases to hide, you know, cover his tracks and such. And at one point he does use the alias Patrick Bateman. And then you know. And both have this ongoing voiceover where they comment on everyday life and their thoughts are things that they could never say. They're, you know, they're, they're, they're talking to the audience, explaining these parts of their own lives. So, of course, you know, there's a, there's a certain level of, like, familiarity that is distinct from, you know, the, the way he, this protagonist, I don't know if you can hear that, but it is indeed very windy. I hope I am deafening that out. Yes, the, the, there is a, there is a familiarity there that differs from if he were talking to someone he's lived his life with. You know, so it is, you know, he is talking to people who at first don't know him at all, but then as the show moves, you know, as as this movie or that show moves on, we know the person more than anybody else knows them because they're they're thinking these things out loud to us that they would never say in the real world. And... Yeah, it and and so much of it is this. They're they're making these points that we're not supposed to say out loud, or they are focusing on things that we know we're not supposed to. And yeah, just there's yeah yeah there there are just various. It it really gives a completely different image of, you know, if, if you, the, the way we see the person act 
and then what we hear them think. And there is, of course, also a tremendous inspiration in the character of 47, the, you know, the, the hitman, the protagonist of the hitman series, the, the player character. And, yeah, this is, you know, the, it came out not long after this. I, I want to say not long after, at least, or possibly, yeah, I, I don't know if they got it from, like, early promotional material or if they got it from, like, the, I don't know the exact, like, when this was done, when it was released, and the same thing for Hitman, but they both wear expensive suits with black gloves for when not to leave a trace. And 47 very clearly uses some of the same, even in the first game. He uses the knife that you saw on the cover before, unless I cut that part out. But yeah, when you, when you look at the cover of the you know, DVD, for the you know one of them the one that doesn't have the the screaming blood splattered face blood splatter anyway yeah that you know he's he's yeah they they both like to use this steak knife i guess it is but yeah and there is you know and and 47 is indeed quite detached there is a little bit of emotion there there is a little bit but there's there's very little attachment and there's very there's there's a cynicism and a sort of there's for both of them it is very simple why they kill and why yeah the their why they kill, why they feel more or less okay with it, why they, why they feel the way they feel about their, their killing. And, you know, much like how Vice City, the, the Grand Theft Auto game, or expansion pack, I don't know if it qualifies, is, is basically, you know, well, not entirely, but there are elements of Scarface in there clearly and where Scarface is a tragic story you know Vice City is very much you're supposed to enjoy it it's you know you get to indulge in this thing you know that same way the 47 the, the Hitman series is yeah you you get to do a lot of brutal murder I mean you you sure if you actually do want to complete levels you probably have to kill them more subtly but you're still killing people that and it's not like revenge it's just you're being paid to kill this person i mean with a lot of the briefings they try to make clear oh this is this is an awful person you know but there's still some of them that you know it's just well they're in the way and yeah it is kind of where where this story you're not supposed to watch this and go out, you know, it's it's like the, I think the movie, is the movie just called Wall Street Battle of the Stone with Michael Douglas, you know, greed is good, and how people, a bunch of people, you know, rich people actually thought, yes, that is exactly right, and became a cheer for them where it was supposed to be a an indictment. Yeah, <laughs> movies and, and video games don't always, yeah. But to be fair, the, you know, the Hitman games aren't really saying that, you know, murder is necessarily, you know, like, uh, it doesn't necessarily approve, it just tries to make a good case for why you maybe shouldn't feel too bad about it. And it does, it is very sleek and cool and stylish. Yeah, it is still, you know, yeah, I think that about covers that. And there is, of course, also, with the name Patrick Bateman, a reference to Norman Bates, a another American 
psycho. And yeah, the there there are various details to to both that there there is a certain a lack of comfortable connection with other people. Ellis did not feel that... Actually, first I should say, Ellis said that something he liked about the movie was that Patrick was made to be extremely uncool, a total loser, and yeah, that is quite... <laughs> yeah, you you really like... <laughs> he, he has this awkward dance that he does sometimes, and just... There's this early scene where the 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 Wall Street guys are basically talking about women and really degrading them like they're talking about you know well I mean if she has a good personality even if she's not great looking and then another one says great personality or talented or smart you know talented even if this woman is talented or whatever that even means you know, that's just that this woman is trying to make up for, you know, being very unattractive. He doesn't use those exact words, but I'd rather not repeat them. Yeah, and, you know, they're so they're doing this. And then Bateman says, you know what Ed Gein said about women? And, and he's like, he's cheery because he has this, he knows these things about serial killers. Like, I mean, he's, he knows what he is and he's read up uh, on these people and, yeah, so he just has these fun little tidbits, these facts that are just, did you know, did you know that Ed Gein once said that when he looks at a beautiful woman, he thinks two things, and, you know, first he thinks, I'd like to take her out and be real nice to her and just really make her happy. And then, you know, he's asked, well, what did the other part of him think? What her head would look like on a Thick. And then he's laughing, and then, yeah, this, and and the others are like, dude, you know, and they still don't really. Again, you would expect that it's like, you know what, you and I, just, I don't even, I don't know you anymore. That is, that is just, you are not a person that I want to hang around. That you think that that is at all okay to laugh at. That you think that passes for casual conversation. But the thing is, he he just went a little bit too far. You know, it's it, it's in part showing that he doesn't, he really doesn't get other people. I mean, several of these other Wall Street guys, they're basically just, they don't realize how vacuous this is. You know, Bateman does. But, you know, yeah, there's, to Bateman, the, the, it's already slipped. Because you, I'm going to try to choose my words carefully, but if you can do whatever you want, and you eat what you want, screw who you want, you know, do whatever drugs you want, when you want it, how you want it, then at some point you, you know, if you just, if you keep trying to find, trying to find a boundary and you keep not finding one, then eventually you may slip into actual violence, actual immoral acts. And, you know, there is, I mean, you know, you can say that, they, you know, oh, come on, that no Wall Street guy is an actual serial pill. You know, <sighs> Wall Street people and, you know, people who own big businesses and, you know, run big and such, a lot of them have done something really awful, just not necessarily in their personal life. Some some of them have, but not necessarily quite this. But I mean, they're, yeah, they're, they're cutting costs and, you know, removing safety, you know, equipment and such, you know, just, yeah, to save a little money, to increase profits and not caring that people get hurt. You know, like literally, they, they know, they know that this is going to 
hurt, even kill people, and they don't care. And that's part of what the film is really about. So, you know, it's not just this thing of, you know, imagine if one of these guys was also a serial killer, you know, and a robot. But, yeah, just, you know, because really, he, Bateman just crossed the line. It's, I mean, what they were just saying was turning women into objects already. You know, he just went that extra step and said, I mean, if they're objects, you know, why can't we dismember them? And, you know, you know, they're, they're talking about how, you know, women, they're just there for sex. And if you don't want to have sex with them, they don't matter at all. And this thing. And, yeah, he just went that little step further and it's a part that really well illustrates yeah he doesn't really he doesn't do well when he's trying to like fit in and when he's just like because he just he didn't realize that that would be an awful thing to say you know and the and and at the same time it's just that these yeah these views and then these horrible acts are not that far I mean that is also when you when you look at people people who do truly awful things to for example women they tend to be people who have a hatred for a, a lack of respect a you know in general a, a very bad relationship with that group of people you know if, Crimes against women, crimes against people of different ethnicities, you know. Yeah, so it it does a really good point of just, yeah, saying that this is, you know, yeah, pointing out that they are, there's not necessarily that huge of a difference between, yeah. And this was one of the first films, I believe, where Christian Bale went through tremendous physical change. And, yeah, I mean, the man is a <laughs> incredibly methodical and a little bit scary when it, when it comes to the lengths. I mean, this one, you know, he's just really fit, but the stuff like The Machinist is like, are you okay? <laughs> It's it's like I recently said about Tom Cruise and the stunts he does. Like I, I'm not sure that he's entirely. I mean, if there wasn't a camera crew, we would just be saying this guy is like, you know, really out there. He's like he's doing these extreme stunts. Even I don't know, maybe just to feel alive or something. But just yeah. And again, with if Christian Bale lost as much weight as he did for Machinist just because then he would probably face like a a you know intervention or or yeah at the very least some have pointed out how at times his performance is kind of emulating Jim Carrey that is that is kind of true and that's also where some of the comedy comes in and i should say you know the the awkward dance and such most of the comedy that of him is not really physical and it's not too you know the the i think that might have also been ellis he felt that some of the dancing got too slapsticky and a little too far maybe yeah but on the whole it doesn't on the whole it just really works and yeah he is both he is funny he is chilling and the, you know, the, the layers to him you can really see. And, you know, there have been, like, theories about might he be gay, you know, might, closeted, and might that be part of what's really going on here, you know, and, and his anger at having to act straight, at having to engage in straight relationships, straight sex, you know, that that might be what's going on you know there there is you know some people approach this as maybe he doesn't actually do the the crimes or such
I suppose at the end of the day you can say that it is more ambiguous. I tend to lean towards that he did them and I think that is an important point to make although I won't go into why in this. I will say that for the thoughts video but yeah you know and others have said that Bateman is supposed to be a surrogate for Reagan which again I mean you could you could say that again you know these these horrific acts and this yeah the the vacuousness and kind of yeah you know when you when you look away from the hero worship of Reagan I mean he did horrible damage to America and lasting damage and he was not a smart person I mean people he was he was an actor and people just people voted for him for the personality because he seemed like you know a guy that you'd want you know ah oh, he takes charge in the movies so obviously he'll also do the best thing for the interest of the entire country that you know yeah and there's there's this great scene where Patrick goes on a date with this young woman and when he first encounters her which I think yeah that's that's before they the two of them have a date by themselves he points out about her that his girlfriend or is it fiance anyway his you know Reese Witherspoon his romantic interest probably knows that he himself is having sex with her close friend her closest friend Courtney and then he he mentioned about mentions about Courtney that she is always operating on antidepressant or something like that I think it's Xanax tonight and you know at other point it's like lithium that's mentioned and just and you look at this woman and she's just she's not quite she's not completely aware of the world that's around her but she's again just going through the motions and nobody you know sits her down and says you know I if you feel you need that much medication then you probably should be being taken care of because it's not you shouldn't be out and about when you are this affected by the you know the drug and you know it's also again we're talking intervention like is this really the the I mean did did your did your doctor say that you should take this much this often and if so maybe get a second opinion and just you know it's clearly just and there's no nobody nobody reacts everyone can see it but nobody does anything and just yeah, so so he's on this date with her, and again, I mean, they they sit down. He got her from the car, and she's like, on the table, you know, face down. And he goes on Courtney, you know, shoulders, and then sits her up. And she's like, "Are we at the restaurant?" She's not even she's not even sure about that. She's just like, restaurant, right? this looks like a restaurant we must be at the restaurant and he's he says yes and then he he claims that they're at a specific one which is very expensive I think it, it's the one called Dorcia and he called Dorcia earlier you know because yeah she you know sure of course he can get seats at Orsia of course I mean sure it's extremely expensive and you have to really be somebody but okay he you know so he finds out okay she and I are going out tonight so he calls Dorcia and he asks I know this is late but is it possible to get a table tonight at you to tonight with you 
8, 8.30. And the response is this hysterical laughter. And not just for a few seconds, just like he goes on and on laughing. It's not like a quick laugh and then, oh, sorry, no. And he doesn't even hang up the other guy. N neither of them do for, for a few seconds. He just keeps laughing and laughing. This is the single most ridiculous thing he's ever heard. Patrick might as well have just asked him, would it be okay if I brought a Martian to dinner at your place tonight? Do you have any rules against that? It's And, and so they get there, and she's like just completely, she's gone. And he, she says, this is Dorcia? And then he says, yes, it is. And then we see the menu, and it's, I think it's called es Esprit or something, which is, you know, it's not as fancy, but that is still a pretentious name. Yeah. So, so it's a... Yeah, so, and, and then he tells her what she, not, not, you know, not just a suggestion, he tells her, you're going to order this. And she, you know, she's, she's that suggestible, and it's that just understood that, you know, well, the guy's in charge, and just, yeah. And he tells her what she should get, and then says, then, then he quotes word for word, the, the review, he's not like taking credit for it, but he quotes the review from, I think it's like the New York Times. You know, and, and this is where like, you know, when you go to a restaurant and you, you suggest something to be ordered, you, you relate to the restaurant and to the person and you say, this place has great, you know, whatever, like, I don't know what do people like. I'm not a restaurant person myself, but yeah, you know, you you say you know the great crabs, whatever, you know. That's the the kind of thing. But but no, he just sits there and he, you know, quotes. He memorized this thing. He memorized the review from the so so. It's like that's it. That's what what you should get. You know, and it's it's a and and that's. Part of where you see this detachment. It's just there's no like, you know, he didn't he didn't think about it particularly, just you know, he he read review and eh, that sounds good, so you know, try that. And just yeah, it's it's a yeah, it's, it's there there's more to it which I'll also get to. And the I think that just about covers that scene. Yes, the uh, you know when basically the the to Patrick and to the others, the idea is that you look successful, and the. You know, that is that is why you should, you know, and that's, yeah, that is that is the goal. He, he is always, like, checking his hair. There's, there's a point where another, another vice president, Pierce Pierce, I'm pretty sure, Lewis, is, like, complimenting his suit. And then he, like, reaches out and almost touches it and, like, immediately... Bateman gets, you know, rid of his hand, and, you know, that, again, you could read into, you know, is it, like, repressed homosexuality? Does he actually want to be touched? And the, the, all the feeling that, you know, what what is that line? Don't touch me, I'll die if you touch me, I think is. I'm not sure if I should give away where that's from, but I hope that you who have already, who are familiar with that movie knows what I'm talking about. But yeah, the, you know, that's, that's one possibility. Or it's, you're going to risk messing up the suit. This is, you know, this is important to me, you know, so yeah. 
And the fact that he looks so good might be why people disregard these threats. You know, that, he, you know, well, he wouldn't actually hurt me. I mean, he looks successful. Successful people don't, you know, that's, that's this kind of, this idea that we still, you know, have that you, you look at someone who's well-dressed and looks good and you're like, you know, that's always what they say, you know, I can't believe he could have done that. I've known him for so many years and he seems nice and well, you know, well-dressed, well well spoken and you know and then when when people see someone who doesn't look like they're completely okay they're like be careful he might be dangerous and the you know and it might also just be that they're that used to it being said that they're that used to people getting away with that when they look that good when they're that rich i mean they're allowed to they're that they're that successful and there's this one of the real standout scenes is of course the the business card comparison and you know a i don't remember exactly who but an online you know a a reviewer a, you know, film critic said that the, the scene is like ego shattering and just it, it might as well be a scene of Russian roulette rather than just them comparing business cards. And it really is just an amazing scene. And it's basically Bateman, kind of, you know, says, check this out. I just had a new business card printed because this is this is his identity. I mean, when he isn't there, and especially to people who don't really know him personally, the business card is the impression and the, the memory that it conjures up. So when someone looks at his business card, it should be amazing. It should be the most impeccable business card ever. And so he shows it off and, and just gleeful, like barely containing, I can't believe they like it, you know, and, and, and then one of the others says, take a look at this, you know, and he, you know, he shows it to Bateman who says, yeah, that's nice. You know, he, he tries to be nice to this guy because this is a guy who actually is also powerful so he has to be nice to him you know they hang out all the time so you know there's a limit to how you know yeah he's gonna be you know and you know the one, one of the others seems to like it more you know and Bateman immediately thinks to himself I can't believe he likes that one more than mine and it's just, it's, again, like, he looks like he was just told that, you know, his mother died this morning or something. It's just, this is the worst thing that's ever, I can't believe. It's just, it's that level. And, and this is, and, and the, the movie plays it like it is that important. And to us. It just, it may, you know, that's when we're really talking about, like, absurd. It's like, it's a business card. It's not that important, you know. But to them, it's everything. Because it's what, it's the, it's the impression. It's what they look like to other people, to important people. And the... I shouldn't give away too much about the scene, but just, you know, yeah, it, it just, it keeps, I mean, it, it goes, the, it gets to the point where he can't hide it at all. Like, you know, the, the others could easily tell that this is just, he's, he's, this is, this is, yeah, this is the worst thing that's, that's ever and the 
there's this scene where he he calls for an escort girl and he you know when he's talking over the phone for that you know he says he's not talking to the girl specifically he's called like a service or something escort service and he says her hair should be blonde i cannot you know i cannot overstate that her hair needs to be blonde and then you know she arrives he lets her in and the moment that she steps into the light in his apartment he immediately says your hair's not blonde that's like dirty blonde and and you can immediately tell from her face you know you know you can immediately tell that that it it hurt her she doesn't say anything because she's I mean, she has to make money. She's there as, I mean, hypothetically, let's say she did what she should be allowed to do. Let's say that she said, you jerk, I'm leaving. And just, you know, possibly more, but I try to keep off-color language out of my videos mostly so I don't have to note if there is any or how much there is. so I usually just say you know but that is what she I mean what a jerk what an unbelievable what a creep but if she does that she might not I mean it could really have consequences for her job and you know so she just has to put up with it and he's just and it doesn't even occur to him that I mean he's because he's not talking to a person I mean she he called for her and then she came and she's being paid by him by a lot to have sex so I mean she should just do what he says and be what he says because He's paying for this. His, his success means that he's allowed to do this in his mind. And, I mean, he's acting like a spoiled child. He's, it's like a, a spoiled child who just got, like, the, the action figure they wanted. And then, you know, and, and it's, like, hugely expensive. It's really rare. And then they immediately say, it's the wrong color on the belt. You know, it's just the moment that even the tiniest thing isn't the way that you know yeah that that he thinks it should be it's just this isn't good enough you know and i mean he doesn't send her back but i mean he only has so many hours so fine i will work with what i have but i'm not happy you know it's it's that kind of just and he like he obsesses over pop music like because he's he's not getting any depth in the people he's around so what do you do then well the the pop culture you you know he obsesses about these things like I already mentioned the you know these other serial killers and he you know today you know everybody is like you know a lot of us are you know big lovers of pop culture and quote and reference and such but we don't do that to the expense of everything else you know to the expense of other people I mean at least hopefully not you know it's you know I mean we use it in you know when we're around other people we like we share movies or music or such you know we connect over that but to him it's he doesn't really share it with others. He just spends forever thinking about these things. And then he he lectures other people on how brilliant this pop song is, this this Phil Collins song, this Huey Lewis and the News, you know, song. And then he brutally murders you.
And that just it and that's that's another example of just how the the tone in this just suddenly. Okay, that yeah. You know, and, and again I'm not there are times where this might happen, there are times where it won't happen, you know, you never know what, what this movie is going to give you next. You never know what it's going to do next. There are times where Patrick talks to other people as if he's narrating a story in their head. Like, he says to himself, he, like, he says to another guy, you know, they're, they're, you know, out drinking together or something. Well, they're, yeah, they're having dinner, but, you know, getting drunk. And he's like, is that Ivana Trump? And then he says to the other person, who hasn't yet really responded, of course not, Bateman. Why would Ivana Trump go here? You're right. As if he's, he's narrating this other guy's either response or just, you know, internal monologue about, you know, like he, he, he has so much of, an, of his own internal monologue that other people must have this too. And he'll, he'll join in, you know, he'll, he'll suggest that, you know, or this is what you're thinking, isn't it? And just, yeah. And if he were to meet someone else who actually did like this, the, the same pop, song or such you know he can turn just ice cold excuse me in just you know in in just a fraction of a second you're not allowed to like that that's my thing you don't get this gives me joy it's mine do you know who i am it's it's this thing of you know this is also my father and I have spoken a lot about Ayn Rand and I gave him a a biography of her by someone who was intent on getting to the truth and apparently I I haven't pers I haven't personally read it he's just told me about what he's read and. Apparently, the the author, the moment that the the like foundation, I guess, found out that she was writing the truth, they stopped giving her access to the the letters and such. And several times, there, you know, in in this biography, several times in Ayn Rand's life, she, you know, she loved a specific like, you know. For example, for example, and when she, if she found out that someone else also liked him, she would not have anything more to do with that person, because that actor belongs to her, because that's really the core. And I'm, I'm not gonna say that that like Ayn Rand was this complete psychopath, but I think it is clear to anyone who really digs that she did have some some problems that is it is it splitting that it's called like you know that that she just she separated everything into just pure black and white and everything that was good was was like hers and something she used and everything that was bad was just not at all you know I, i'm not a you know i i don't have a phd i don't i'm not going to diagnose you know someone based on, you know, I, I haven't, even even if I would, based on what I've read, I haven't read anywhere near enough to, to do so. But there was clearly a detachment, which, you know, she, she was detached from a lot of the world around her. And that's, you know, yeah, it, it seems to me that, that that is that thing that, you know, when you you know, then you can't handle that someone else also likes it, you know, where, you know, if, if you're a more healthy, you know, when, when you find out that someone else likes the same thing as you, you might, again, connect over it, 
you know, say, I really like this part of that, you know, but yeah, it's, you know, now, and, you know, some have also said that, it, you know, that he doesn't actually care about the music and such. I disagree. I think it means the world to him that it's, he, he listens to music as he comes into work. So he doesn't have to say hello to anyone, it seems to me. And, you know, yeah, he doesn't really react. I mean, he's, he's always stone-faced while he's doing it. But that's because he's not really made, like, happy by it or upset. It just, it drowns out the, the monotony and banality of all of this. And, you know, and again, there, there is this scene where he walks in and he just... Actually, I haven't gotten to that part yet, but but yeah, he walks in and, you know, the others, you know, some of them do still say hello, you know, disregarding that he's clearly not, you know, no eye contact, he's listening to, he probably can't hear them, they're just, you know, well, that's something you do, right, when you pass each other, you say hello, it doesn't matter if the other person responds or can even hear you, you know, and they, were, and they greet him with the wrong name, you know, so that's something that happens a lot, isn't it? I will get more into that. Now, uh, some have said that the movie, that it's a problem that there is no one that you can really sympathize with. There's no one you can root for. I would hope that you don't find someone to root for in this, pretty much, because there's almost no one, but that's not really the idea. I, you're supposed to understand Patrick. You're supposed to, like I said, you know, the movie makes you feel his, you know, his, his dissatisfaction, his, you know, you want to you, you too want to get away from this world, get away from all this, you know, and that's the thing, where do you go? He's at the top of the world. I mean, he's, this is what everybody dreams about. Big Wall Street hotshot. He can do what he wants. He can be with who he wants. He's young. He's attractive. So, yeah, if that isn't enough, what on earth do you do? And his answer, although not necessarily by like conscious decision or choice, is the violence. And the yeah, it's it's other than that, other than you somewhat understanding Patrick, the film is you know for you to just see what it's like, what this world is really like, you know, it's, I mean, that's, that's the thing, this is, this is not a series of, you know, glamorous photos, this is not a, you know, it, it uses the, the, the angles, and the, yeah, you know, it, it makes things look glamorous, but then at the same time, you know, maybe there's, you know, something else going on or, or the like, but right from the start, you know, this is, I mean, immediately after we see all this fancy food and, and like I said, we're, we're looking at it. Do I eat this? Do I put this on my wall? Immediately, one of the guys says, I hate this place, you know, and, and it's just, you know, you're you're at this really fancy place, and just openly saying, you know, just because that's you know you you get you get used to it, and then you just expect more. So you know, this and and then they you know they they get the 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 bill. You know, there's just three or four people eating, five hundred and seventy. That's very reasonable, and just. 
yeah, it it you know, and then you see them all drop their their platinum credit cards, all the exact same, and the you know, and the you know, so that they can go charge, and and it's just this, yeah, because they can afford it. That's you know, that's cheaper than some of the other you know. Or less expensive. There's nothing about them. It's cheap, obviously. But you know, and and yeah, when when you get there, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that this is fancy. Everything's fancy. One of the deleted scenes, Patrick talks to, to Reese Witherspoon, and he's like, Why don't you just go for that other guy? Why would I go for that other guy? He's rich, everybody's rich. He's handsome, everybody's handsome now. And and that's the thing. There's no, there's no up anymore. They're there. They're at the top. There's no more. There's nothing more they can do. So they just get bored with it because they're always getting everything they want. And so, yeah, it's just, you know, what? Well, I I don't feel like this right now. Let's do something else. You know, and it it doesn't matter to them that the you know their behavior is you know just ridiculously you know offensive really I, you know not just impolite or something you know they are being really awful this is again if they were not dressed right no one would put up with this but it's like they're successful they get to do what they want you know now, but but yeah, you know, you're supposed to kind of see what Patrick sees and such. And other than that, yeah, you're supposed to laugh or cry or not quite know which. Maybe some of both at just this this image, which is not that far from the truth. It's not that exaggerated. I mean, this. Like I said, this does exist in a world that isn't completely like you know. There is some stuff where it's like in the real world that wouldn't quite fly. But you know, at the core, again, you know, we're not talking Martians and dying mothers. We are talking just okay. They wouldn't quite be able to do that, but almost. You know, it's not completely out there and it's not unrelated. It's just exaggeration. Some and some have called the movie itself misogynist and I completely disagree most of the major characters and certainly Patrick himself who the films the entire film is from his perspective nothing happens in the film that we see that doesn't directly relate to him nothing the these people do have lives outside you know it's enough we're, we're seeing enough to get an idea of what all of them are like and Patrick is the one who stands out because he's the one who realizes that this is wrong and that this is you know yeah he's he's the one who really wants something else the rest of them are just like, like I said you know everyone's good looking now so it's you know yeah sure whatever it's you know and we're, you know, he's thinking, I'm not offering her anything. And, you know, then he points to another person and says, oh, he's got these qualities. Everyone does. She doesn't say, so do you, sweetie. She just says, everyone does, you know. And, and you know, when he says, why don't you just go for someone else? I mean, he's possibly not even consciously. He's fishing for a compliment. He's saying, you know, Tell me what I do for you. Why? Why do you want me? You know, it's just that kind of thing, and yeah. And yeah, the the film itself is not misogynist, but the major characters are, and Bateman definitely is, and the whole film is from his perspective. But you do see more to these characters. You, you know, when you. I mean, you, you maybe have to extrapolate or note. But like I said, you know, Bateman doesn't notice or care that this escort girl is insulted. You know, to 
so so you know but we're still seeing it we're, we're seeing and in that brief exchange in that look that she gives and that then she continues to go into the apartment you know from that we can extrapolate this is I mean, this is probably, this is happening to her all the time. But that expression on her face is just like, this again, not again. That, not this guy, too, I was hoping. But this is, this is what they are. That I can't, you know, I can't catch a break. I can't meet one who doesn't insult me immediately. You know, that's, that's kind of, or maybe this is the first time that it was quite that fast. But... It's clear, you know, it's not just, like, she's not another one of these sport people. She's not, like, you know, she, she's not, like, reacting, you know, really negatively to something minor, the way these others are. You know, she, I mean, what was said was really, yeah, you know, really insulting. And... Yeah, you know, and, and this is before, like, before names are really exchanged. It's just, it's the first thing. The moment he sees her hair, that's not what I asked for, you know. And, yeah, from, from that you can tell this is not, you know, it, you know, she comes in, like, smiling. And, it, you know, and, and then the moment you see the smile go away, you also kind of, you know, think to yourself, the smile before was put on, wasn't it? The, the her smiling as she's walking in that's because she knows that that's what he'll want you know she and she has to make a good first impression and you know this this kind of thing but there is more there there is more to the the female characters and it's a lot in these little looks or you know yeah the I may go more into her, but just, if you're watching this for the first time, pay attention to the character of Jean. Her, there's definitely more to. Now. You know, in addition to, you know, I already talked about the ambiguity of whether he does these things, or if it's like something he's imagining, like violent escapist fantasies i i think it's important to to take as as a as a reality that in the fiction of the movie what he does he actually does it's not just imagination and from there, you know, then you can, you know, start to, you know, either you're maybe trying to distance yourself from him or maybe you're trying to understand why is he doing this. But I would say you, you do have to start from a position. If you watch this movie and you leave disgusted and thinking, I hope there's no one like Patrick Bateman, I don't understand at all why he would do that and I never want to watch this movie again, that I think is a more, I mean, this was the way the movie was made, and the book is even more gruesome. You know, I've read little excerpts of it in doing research for this. They didn't make it so that everyone would have a good time, and then, you know, recommend it to all their friends. They made it to shock. They made it to really make an impact. And yeah, if yeah, if if you find it, you know, repulsive that this person is doing that uh, and, you know, you don't understand, I think that's more what the creators want than if you leave it saying I completely understand Patrick and the fact that he had these fantasies but didn't live them out, you know, I don't think that's what they would want. And again, basing that on the, the research and, yeah. A, 
the majority of the dialogue here is taken word for word from the novel. That's also something I saw when when reading just things that spoke about the novel and, you know, you know, writing out lines. As, that's also in the movie. That's in the deleted scene. That's in the movie, you know, so, yeah, that's, that's really, really cool. They they went to great extents to put everything in that they could, basically, and also to make it, you know, some of the elements that are more, you know, atrocious in the book are, you know, yeah, were, were removed so that it could actually be released in theaters and, and such, you know, not end up with an NC-17 or even an X. But, you know, and I should say, I'm, when, when this kind of thing comes up, there's always, I understand reading or watching or hearing something and thinking that's the most disgusting and that's awful. And, you know, and, and from that taking, I can't stand the person that, you know, thought this up. I can understand that. I personally try to understand what they're trying to say with it before I make an opinion about the person themselves. But certainly, and, and don't get me wrong, if you, you know, if you watch 10 minutes of this and you, you know, you think this, I don't, I don't want to watch another second of this. That is complete. It, this is not going to be for everyone. You know, the... You know, that, that is the thing with, like, really shocking movies, really gory and such. You know, either you... I mean, I made the very conscious decision at age 12 that I was going to... to... to I was going to watch so much of it and force myself to keep watching, even if I wanted to look away, that I could watch these this kind of movie without you know looking away without being too you know and yeah it it hurt it was a process but and i'm not saying that everyone should but i made the decision that i don't want to go through my life unable to take in works of creative expression i'm not going to use the word art i know that not everyone will agree with that but works of any work of creative expression, regardless of the quality, I don't want to put it away because it is too too violent or too sexual or the like. And language, I don't even that doesn't bother me at all. But yeah, or drugs, never really. I, th I think my life has been too sheltered from drugs to really be at all upset when characters in movies do drugs, but whatever. Yeah, that was, you know, I if, if you watch just a little of this and you put it away, I completely understand. And I would say you're missing something great, but it's not going to be for, I don't watch opera. There are a million people who are going to say, oh, dude, you are missing just the most amazing. And I can totally imagine. But I just, I'm, I'm not into opera. And there you go. There's, regardless, there's always going to be something that you can't, I mean, it's, well, you only have the one life to live. Sorry, Apu. You know, it's, you know, you can't learn all of these different languages and all these different, you know, not just verbal languages, but also language of, you know, dancing and, you know, ballet and all this stuff. So you, you make choices and yeah, I chose gory cinema over ballet and opera. And, uh, yeah, it's a... Yeah, it's, it's, it's a very shocking film. And it's going to be too much for a lot of people. And the, the book even more so. But the moment that you say that people shouldn't be allowed to to go far in their creative expression that i think is a big 
problem. I don't think that you should. I am against censorship. What I am for is, I guess you might say, trigger warnings. If you have content to put out that is going to shock people, I do think that it should be, you know, there should be a, a an objective description of the worst content in it so that people going in know you know what is I mean I don't I've hardly watched any of Peter Jackson's earliest stuff you know the the really gory stuff I've hardly watched any of it but what little I saw I could tell that's not for me so I stopped watching it and I've never really gone back you know and if I hadn't watched that but if I had read this is in the film then I would also have said that's not for me you know that's not censorship that's the consumer choosing what they want to consume you might say you know and and be be explicit be you know be specific say exactly what but and and put a, a high rating on it. I understand that. I understand saying, you know, I don't want a you know a minor to watch something that, you know, has really gruesome violence or you know I mean we, we know that children can't quite cope with very I mean they can they can understand some really complex things we, we now know, but they can't handle if there's something very violent. Let's let's say a a parent is murdered or something in a film. That might be, you know, or, or yeah, yeah, something. Let's say let's say that let's say they're watching that Menendez boys biography movie. You know, not every you know children are not going to be able to, to understand. The parents are really awful to the children, and the children grow up and murder them. You know, and, and I'm not making some kind of statement about, you know, I'm not talking about whether it was, you know, whether anyone deserved to be set to jail or to be murdered or whatever. I'm just using that as an example. Children are not going to be able to process that. They don't have the, the capacity to it yet. So obviously, yes, you save that for when the brain is fully matured. But the moment you start, and especially today, where it's not difficult to like say, you know, okay, so we have this, you know, you can mass produce a film or a song or the like so so just make the different versions and say okay once you're older you can get this version but don't eliminate the things that really offend people I, I really don't agree with with that practice anyway and then there are people who go so far as to say that you know if when someone writes stuff like this they should have something that they've written about happen to them. And first of all, what they're writing is fiction. They're not actually doing this thing. They're they're this this is a piece of fiction that you know that shows something that you know. I I admit there are some really awful things in you know works of creative expression, but the moment that you you know equate creative expression, you know something fiction being really awful with the person being really awful or being willing to do these awful things that's a huge leap that is completely unreasonable and the moment that you then say that something bad should happen to them something as bad as what they write first of all again huge leap to to even be and you're now lowering yourself to the level of what you say the other person is at. You're going way, in reality, you're going way farther, farther. You're, you know, saying that something bad should happen to someone who just expressed themselves. Again, I'm not saying you don't have to go up and hug them and say this is the most wonderful thing you've ever done. There are, again, 
I'm never I'm never going to watch the early Peter Jackson movies. I don't personally, you know, until I watched Lord of the Rings, I didn't have that high opinion of him because it seemed to me like, you know, I didn't, and maybe that's because I didn't see so much of it, but I didn't really see any anything deeper to it. To me, it seemed like just really gruesome violence for the sake of it, and that I'm not interested in. That I'm not really, at least at the time, I didn't think very highly of it, but yeah. I think that's pretty much everything I want to say about the censorship issue. This has some similarity to Oscar Wilde comedies. You know, you're, we're supposed to laugh at the upper class. And this is also very much about male narcissism. And, you know, it's a period piece very much about the 80s and the the male characters, uh, you know, excuse me, devotion to looking good, you know, in front of each other, you know, makes them look, you know, somewhat stereotypy stereotypically gay. That they, you know, not that there's anything wrong with that, but just, you know, and and again, these are men who are fiercely straight. They would never, especially in the '80s. Yikes! You know, you would not want to be. Yeah, you know, this was still, you know, AIDS was still somewhat considered, you know, oh, it's the gay disease, isn't it? So, yeah, it would, yeah. So they would, they would hate to be thought of as gay, but the intensity of the focus that they, they have on looking good in front of each other you know, makes them seem that, you know, the, it's, it's about looking good in front of the other, the, the other potential alpha males, you know, and it's, you know, the, the women, uh, you know, distant afterthought to, to quote, again, I believe the IMDb fact. And, you know, it's about these yuppies, hedonism, capitalism, consumerism, conform, Conformism? Yeah. Classism, materialism, apathy, superficiality, greed, you know, and they don't think something is good because there is depth to it. Certainly they wouldn't appreciate if there was depth to it. Something is good because it is costly, because it is rare, or because it gives them personally a thrill, you know. Drugs to them is better than, you know, if, if they saw a piece of art and didn't know it was expensive, even if it was like the most amazing piece of art that, you know, if, if yeah, if, if they didn't yet know that they were supposed to think or that, you know, it was considered by professionals to be, this one, I'm, I'm not going to get into, you know, which, you know, what art is, is better or, you know, yeah, if, if they looked at something that they didn't know was considered to be amazing, they wouldn't think very highly of it. The, you know, this, where, whereas the moment that they, you know, look at, for example, drugs or just an, an attractive woman that they have a chance of having sex with, you know, that to them is really, you know, it's, it's these very base pleasures kind of they're they're always satisfying the these immediate needs the identity is also a major theme in this and uh, yeah the the you know, it's the the idea of the reliable narrator. The, the, I haven't studied this stuff professionally, so I'm just going by. I guess it's called the unreliable narrator or the reliability of the narrator. I especially haven't studied it in English. I'm Danish, so I have to translate these things to what I think they mean. But yeah. 
you know, it's, it's more, you know, books are a better format for that kind of thing because you literally, when it's a first person, you know, perspective that it's being presented as, you only have the, the narrator's word on it and he might not know everything. He might not want to, you know, be, be honest about it and yeah they they do go for some of that here as well and yeah you know it's it's never quite as you know in in movies it's just not quite the 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 format the medium that best fits we don't really find out anything about patrick's past and it's it's almost as if he doesn't have one and that is, again, that's important because something that, it's something that is so, such a big part of what defines us is our past, is our history. The, the, where we have been, where we are, and where we might be, those are some of the most defining and he doesn't seem to have anywhere that he has been. Where could he possibly go? He's at the top of the world. There's nowhere else to go. There's, he's, he's not going to get any higher up. Now, what's left? Where he is now. And that's just not enough. And that, that's where we get into, that's why there's no change. That's why there's no development. Because he didn't come from somewhere. and He's not going anywhere. He's here. He's probably always been here. He doesn't seem to, I mean, he never says, before this, I was, you know, there's, it seems constant, it seems never-ending. And because of that, it becomes this, just the, the, it becomes not only awful, it becomes intolerable. Because he is trapped. This is a prison and his only escape from the, the prison of this high class is these violent escapades. That, after all, this is something that he isn't allowed to do. Because if you're allowed to do everything, then you, you know, you're, until you find a boundary, you're going to keep checking for boundaries. And you're not necessarily going to be happy with the boundaries. You might try to push them once you found them. But if you never find boundaries, you just keep pushing. And you do the most, you know, just historically, the most egregious things have been done by those with the most power and the most time at their hands. You know, you, you look at dictators, kings, you know, regents, when there isn't war and when they don't have problems to solve. Like I said, the, the start the you know idle hands are the devil's playthings. When you don't have anything to occupy yourself, you are gonna do just insane things, especially if no one's stopping you. And that's where, you know, the upper class who you know who don't necessarily really have someone stopping them, they can do a lot of really crazy stuff and not be stopped. And they have all this time. You know, the you don't see really poor people you know, going out and doing really insane things and thinking, you know, when they do something really out there, it's a reaction. It's not that they want to do this. It's that they feel this is the only way out. And that's, you know, that's also where, you know, Patrick, to, to him, because he doesn't think he fits in. So he's, you know, he's trying to escape and he's doing these things that, you know, some of what he does is definitely reaction. But a lot of it is so detailed, so planned, that it's, yeah, you know, he's not just going into a, a place full of people and shooting, you know, I, you know, if, if, I, I know I almost should do this video a, a few days later so that there would be, you know, a little more distance between me talking about a mass shooting and there actually being a mass shooting, but if I had recorded this a few days later, I might accidentally record it as a new shooting is taking place, so I opted for this instead. Yes, the, you know, he didn't, he's not going into a large place 
opening fire. No, no, he is very carefully planning how he's going to kill. There, there's this sequence where he's talking to someone, and it sounds like they're having a conversation. And all the while, he's walking around checking like his his closets, and he's like feeling knives. Is this one sharp enough? Is this one? Is this one gonna be too unwieldy? Do I need to? You know. And it's just, yeah, he's, there's intricate detail to a lot of this. So it's, again, the way that, you know, they would normally, he's, he's going out and ordering for a murder. He's not, you know, the way that he would otherwise go out and order, you know, he, he would, you know, reserve tables at a restaurant or something. He's reserving, yeah. And also, when you see all his weapons there, they are just, I mean, they're not like carelessly, no, 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 they are clean, they are very delicately placed, there's no, like, there's no, there's no mess there or anything, no, 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 they're very carefully placed and there's, you know, room for everything and, yeah. The... Yes, and the, yeah, identity, there's a lot of mistaken identity in this. And it speaks to that, like I already said some, you know, everybody looks and dresses the same, they listen to the same music, they're working the same jobs. You know, like I said, all these, you know, all the vice presidents of peers and peers, you know. They they go to the same nightclubs. They they have the same hairstyle, you know. So they don't really perceive differences when when they look at each other. If if this if this is not someone that they're with all the time, they don't they don't see someone that they haven't seen before or something. They you know so yeah the the. They don't, they don't necessarily really see that it's a new person. They don't care because it's not important. They're too important to care. And this is a field where, you know, I mean, it's the other person going to correct them. That almost never happens in this because, I mean, you know, it's, does it, does it even matter? Does it, I mean, why would it? You're, you know, I mean, unless you're being confused with someone who, who's lower than you on the right, that would be insulting, but, I mean, you know, and, and he even, you know, the first time Patrick is mistaken, you know, he's saying, he's mistaken me from, for this other guy, I know this other guy, you know, he's, he's often detached from the situation, he knows what's going on when the other people are just reacting, he's, you know, he's thinking what is, you know, again, very, very Dexter, that, you know, what should I say now, what would be a pro, you know, yeah, and then sometimes he still slips up, like with Ed Gein reference, but yeah, the the there's no it it doesn't really matter if they you know, it, and it boils down to there is no individuality. They don't express themselves differently from the others. So how could you tell them apart from the others? And, you know, con conformity, there's, you know, yeah, everyone's the same. You, you, you look as much like the others as, yeah. And there is no real connection. These people never share a connection. They don't, there is, it's, it's all superficial. They, they don't talk about anything deep, or if they do, it's, there, there are actually a few times where it seems like this is, this is deep, but then, it's it's clear that it's like something they read or something that they know they should think. This is what is is right to think, but they don't think it. They, you know, it's it's clear that they don't. That you know, yeah. It, and the you know, there's a, one reviewer you know, points out that Mary Heron, the director, is asking the viewer, what is more, 
what what shocks us more this imagined violence that it is it's a movie you know so so what we're seeing it's not snuff film we're not watching violence we're seeing someone someone's stage violence or this vacuous reality that someone want as their own reality and that is yeah that is a truly excellent point because that really is you know when you and that is you know when when you look at these people you know yeah the, you know it's not like when you're watching scenes that have no violence and there's nothing really you know it's still you know when you watch them compare business cards and how you know Bateman is falling apart over it you know you're not thinking you know this isn't as bad as the violence you're you're thinking is this really that important to him this is this is you know it's yeah and the you know and and these people you know almost by you know by nature objectify the the people that they interact with that you know other than the you know these co-workers and such you know to to them you're you know you're a waiter you're a bartender you're a coke dealer you're a you know sex object so yeah you know there's no so there there really is no identity you know it you're you're rich and famous or you service those who are rich and famous and in neither case is your name or past or day-to-day -day life at all important to the other rich and famous because why would it be we're all the same so yeah you know each time and this this even happens when they you know when they mistake their you know each other's identity and such they'll ask how's you know and and they might get the name right you know how's cynthia how's you know and yeah so so you know these completely i mean they're talking to a person and they don't realize that they're talking to the wrong person but they got the, the you know you're with with her right how's that going not because they care but because that's what you're supposed to say right when you talk to someone when you greet them it's like how are things going with your personal life you know it's not it's not a question it's just that's the right thing to say in that situation it's it's a i'm not sure if it's an act but it's just a it's yeah it's what's expected it's the same thing as paying for your bill you know when when someone brings you you know when you've eaten and they bring you your bill you pay when you meet someone that you know the name of you're supposed to greet them and ask how their spouse is doing that's it you know there's nothing deeper there it's just oh that's expected This is a dark comic drama horror satire. It, you know, there there is you know blood, violence. It's shocking. It's gory. You know, there's there's sex. A lot of it is left up to our imagination. You know, we or we'll see maybe the aftermath or you know the the planning or something. But you know, we won't. We don't see that much, really, you know, yeah. And it's it's very effective how so much of it is left up to the imagination. Obviously, again, from my research, the book is much more explicit in a lot of these things. And, you know, the ironic tone, some have said, you know, it's ridiculously uneven, maybe. Yeah, it's, you know, I, I would say it uses it well. And, you know, it's very slick. As a satire, I may have already somewhat, you know, gone into this, but yeah, it's it's not the real world that we're watching. And, you know, this can be 
watched as a slasher, just with, you know, the protagonist being the slasher killer and the, you know, yeah, the, the setting being this high-class society kind of, you know, and definitely, you know, you don't go in to watch it and think that you're gonna get, you know, a Freddy or Jason movie. And yeah, it's definitely not for everyone. It's difficult to share or describe to other people. And Ellis originally said that he didn't feel that he, this book needed to be turned into a film because that medium requires answers which would have made his book infinitely less interesting. But he did come around to liking it. And he he even praised some elements as being better than his book, which I find to be a very, very attractive quality in an artist, in, in, in someone who does creative expression. And I use the term creative expression because it's not always going to be fiction. You know, it might be a drawing of a real event. Um, yeah. But... Yeah, to for him to actually say, you know, this you actually better than like that that's very impressive, but yeah. And he yeah, one one thing he did say is that he felt that I think he also didn't like the ending, same as the director, fellow writer. He thought that Patrick's voiceover was too explicit and you know, it it does, you know, go into detail about you know, people and events, and so, I mean, it's, it's not, like, constant, but there is a lot of it, and, yeah, you know, and that's, again, when you, when you adapt a, which I believe is first person also, I'm almost certain, yeah, it's first person, when you adapt a first person book to, it's a film, it's hard to avoid, you know, narration, and, yeah, I, I would say this is one of the films that gets away with it most of the way. It, it helps that it really is from his perspective. You know, it's it's really about his thoughts. You know, we're we're getting a a glimpse into this man's mind where you know that's not always the you know it's not always specifically about this you know the the protagonists you know, psychology. And some have said that it's heavy-handed and ultimately toothless. I disagree. I think that, you know, I can see what they mean, but I think that it's effective from being, you know, from, from reaching absurdity or reaching for it. And I don't think that the... I think that the ultimate points to the, that we take from it are not too heavy-handed and or when they are it's very very funny or very very you know dramatic and yeah the you know, some said that this has a bad flow and the ending is too predictable. Others have said that, you know, the pace is sleek, airless, and apt. I, you know, I lean towards the latter. And I, yeah, I've already spoken to the ending. And yeah, there, there are a lot of these really sudden fast shifts where, you know, the movie you don't know what to expect. It will suddenly go from these really, you know, fancy kind of, you know, to murder or vice versa. It will just, you know, very, yeah. And, you know, and, and the, you know, yeah, like I said in the plot, it's, it's getting, he's having more and more trouble controlling himself. And, you know, I mean, early on, he is trying to hide it because he knows that this is too far. This is something he's not going to be able to get away with, you know. But, yeah, if, over the course of this, over the course of his, 
career as a serial killer, he is getting less and less, you know, he's losing control and he's getting worse at hiding. Now, the runtime really, the, the running time is very fitting. It's 93 minutes, not counting the end credits, 97 if you do count them. And, you know, the even the violence and sex is filmed, you know, it's it still looks great. It looks, you know, it's, yeah, it's it's sleek. It, it looks like a, a kind of, it, it looks like a movie where a lot of movies go for this violence that is very, you know, unpredictable and kind of really hits you. In this, I mean, the violence gets, you know, out there and, and there are times where it really shocks you and such, but yeah, so it's, there's still this, it's filmed like a, a scene at, you know, an art show or something, and you're, the, the stuff you're looking at, even though it is this, you know, sexual and in, in ways that maybe isn't as accepted, let's just go with that. You know, it's not just sex, because again, I don't personally think that that's to be, again, you know, obviously children shouldn't watch it. Children won't understand it. It's not going to warp their minds, but they're not going to really understand it. And it's, you know, yeah, they, they, but, but yeah, it is, yeah. And, and it tends to be that it's under Bateman's control, the way his entire life is. And, you know, he he poses himself and others. He directs the the sex as if he's directing a porno, as if he's the the guy in the porno. And he has these mirrors, and he you know has the girls look into the camera, and you know he poses in front of the camera. He poses to the mirror so he can look at himself as he's you know having sex, and just it's yeah because you know he watches these pornos. And he's like, oh, I want to be that guy. I wish I was that guy. And that's, I mean, ultimately, when you watch a porn, that is what they want. You know, they want you to think, I'm the, the you know, I'm the guy. Or I'm the, you know, I'm that character. Whatever, you know. And to him, because he has all this money, he has all this time. He got a camera. Sure, why not, you know be in his own porno like that, you know, because that's it. It's not enough for him to have sex. It's not even enough for him to have sex the way they do it in the porno. No, no, no. He needs to make his own porno, which he stars in and, you know, directs as he, and he seems annoyed when he, like, he, you know, he directs them as if they should already know, because obviously, I mean, when you, in the porn, they know the girls just do what they're supposed to. So he is like frustrated, like, what are you waiting for? This is the part in the porn where the girl does that. Get with it. Come on. You know, and yeah. And, and at the same time, then some of the violence, he is, you know, posing. He is making himself the, you know... Yeah, the, the killer in a slash movie, for example. And some have compared the, the film to Kubrick and specifically to A Clockwork Orange. And for sure, there is, yeah, you can, you can definitely tell an inspiration and the, and, you know, I think, like, like I said, with Interstellar very clearly owes a debt to 2001 Space Odyssey. But that does not mean that if you've watched 2001 Space Odyssey, and if you haven't, then why? It's, I'm, I'm joking, again, it's not going to be for everyone, but it's an amazing movie. But you should still watch Interstellar, you know, because it adds something. And this also, again, not, not saying they're better. I mean, it's, 
better than Kubrick, better than... No, 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 but I'm not saying they're better, but they do some things that make both films worth watching, and that is something that definitely, yeah. And no, I probably won't review Kubrick just way above my pay grade. That is, I do not have the... The, the, what's it called? Yeah, I, I'm, I am not on the, the level to, to be able to properly go into Kubrick. I leave that for the far more, yeah, well, well educated and competent. This has been noted as having this very sterile design and especially Patrick's apartment is this very it's it's all white it's it's sharp edges and there's there's no like you know it's it's not it's not inviting it doesn't feel like a home it feels like just something you know it's it's this what do they call it? ultra modern or something I, I, design means nothing to me i that's what my you know, that's what one of my walls and, and some of my shelves look like. So you can probably tell. I don't particularly. Yeah, it's, it's, to be fair, not all of my place is quite as, as messy as some of the, and the films don't, aren't, aren't, you know, I only put those up for, for filming these videos. But anyway, yes, the, it's 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 distinctly it's not just not inviting it is distinctly it feels hostile it it really just yeah just to finish off that thought you know when i say you know hostile and such that is you know that is the way these people do live you know that is what they, you know, because in, yeah, it's, it's like Fight Club, that's what you're supposed to own. You know, there's, there's no individuality, there's no personality to what, you know, Bateman's, it's just, you know, there's some art, there's some really very nicely, you know, it's, it's all just this look and it's not, yeah, you know, I mean, again, you and I look at that place and it's like, I wouldn't live in that no matter what you paid me. And the, yeah, Ellis says of the book that he has come to realize that, you know, it, or was that something else? Anyway, yeah, he says that Bateman was like he was in the 80s, you know, that he was in this consumerist, you know, black hole where, you know, it seems like he should be get he should feel amazing, but he felt worse and worse and worse with all this you know, yeah, all these things that you could, you know, suddenly have anytime you want, anywhere you want it, you know. And this is also, this is a movie that, you know, when with any movie, I mean, it's almost 15 years old, and the book is from 91, I think. So, yeah, I mean, that is 25, almost 24 years or so, and it was about the 80s, which is even longer ago. With something like that, it's all, and, and I already mentioned, it is a period piece. This is very much distinctly placed in the 80s. You know, you can see it on the cell phone. And the fact that everyone has a cell phone, that's, you know, oh, you're so important, you have a cell phone. You know, that back then, that really meant, you know, today, even if you have, like, an expensive phone, that doesn't necessarily mean anything. It could mean that you bugged your parents until they eventually got one, you know, even if you moved out or whatever. But, yeah, it's... Yeah, it's very much, there's there's always the issue of, is it still relevant? And in ways, this has gotten even more relevant, because you hear about, like, how people treat, like, the Starbucks uh, baristas. I'm not a, even if I drank coffee, I don't think I would go to a place like that. But yeah, you know, people feel entitled. People go in there and they yell at the guy or they stand and, and wait in line 
and, and they're on the phone and then they don't to turn off the phone when it's their turn in line. You know, it's this, yeah, it's in some ways much more common now to feel like you're, you deserve better. You deserve to get everything you want anytime because you can afford to have coffee every day. And so, yeah, of course, you know, and it's still, you know, I'm not saying everybody's like that. And it's still, you know, People who do stuff like that and everything are obviously still the very rich or the family of the very, you know, people who know the very rich and such. But there are still areas where even regular people will act like, you know, even if it's just like maybe you just eat at McDonald's, you know, there are still some people who, you know, berate the, the staff or the like and feel like they can get away with it because they know they can get away with it or they they feel it's okay to do because they can get away with it and you know the yeah the movie's all about status symbols rather again rather than actual value and the you know the the characters will quote things they've read or you know that that are in like ads and such rather than actual have you know actually have conversations they just say things that they've heard others say or you know they they you know stare at like commercials and just obsess over things like that and yeah and the patrick he knows that the, you know, okay, I've already mentioned, you know, his view on women. His secretary is this very sweet young girl. Chloe Sivigny plays her and does so amazingly, of course. And I think it's pretty much the first time that he comes in, that we see him. You know, he's, they worked together for years, obviously. But yeah, you know, he comes in to, and then he's like, and, and you know, first he says, Ugh, you can't do this. I'll do it. Don't worry. You know, and then he says, I don't like what you're wearing. You should wear, I think he says like dress and, and high heels. And, you know, and, and at first she's like, really, really? You know, and, and she can't, like the escort girl, she has to just put up with it because she's not powerful enough, you know. And the... You know, and then he says, as if it were a compliment, come on, you're prettier than that. You know, just completely like, you know, just the, the fact that the, the way it makes me feel when I look at you is more important than how you want to express yourself. And I should be able to tell you how to dress as if you were my personal property. I mean, yeah, he's paying her, but it's, you know, she's not a servant. And in that case, you know, I, yeah, I'm, I'm against all that kind of thing. Be self-sufficient, you know, do anything you can do by yourself, do it yourself. But yeah, and, and don't take advantage of other people, no matter how much you're paying them, don't take advantage. Yeah, and it's, and, and then, yeah, she, she says, okay, and she walks off. And the next time we see her, she did indeed put on a dress. And again, it's, you know, he's like, that looks good on you. And it's, yeah, it's, it's this thing of he gets what he wants. Even something like that. I mean, yeah, she's getting paid. And it's, it's a high, you know, I mean, he's, he's a vice president, Pearson Pierce, along with the other, you know, several guys, but she's still just a secretary. It's not like she's, you know, she's not necessarily like making a ton of, I mean, she does at one point say like, she'd like to go back to school and maybe, you know, travel the world and, and these things. But yeah, you know, when, when. You know, she, she can't even have that. She can't even express herself and, and, and wear what she wants. She's not, 
she's attractive, you know, and it's not like she's, you know, it's not like she's not hygienic or something, you know. I mean, obviously, you you know, you have to present her, but she's dressed nicely. She's not wearing something that looks bad or looks like it's just completely inexpensive or something, you know. It's not that. It's just, yeah, he should, and, and it doesn't, he doesn't even pause for a second. He doesn't think at all that this is something that he shouldn't be, that this is too much, you know. And, and again, this is, this is right after he, he comes into work and it's one of the first things, you know, just immediately, come on now, you don't look the way I want you to look, you know, it just because he, he knows he can do this. He feels entitled to the, you know, the women that he pays, you know, whatever they actually do for him, whatever, you know, whatever job they have, he feels that they should wear what he wants them to wear. And the fact that they're not already, and, and look the way he wants them to look, and the fact that they don't already, that's slacking off. I mean, I will let you slide on this one, but come on, next time, next time, you know, you're prettier than this, isn't, you look great, it's, don't dress that badly, you know, don't, you know, and, and again, it's saying, you should already know this, you know, and when he gets this, you know, escort girl up, he, you know, he actually, he tries to impress her, and, you know, she's like, what's, what's going on, you know, she, I mean, she is the the she's used to just being called there for like sex or maybe you know some guys might call her and like take her out to dinner and then that's it but you know she's not she was you know she it was it was specified you know she is there to have sex and she you know yeah, and, and it's his apartment, so it's not like, you know, oh, we're going to have to, no, no, if, if they were going to have dinner, he would take her out. So the fact that, you know, she comes in and, you know, okay, sit down, okay, and then he tries to impress her and like, you know, I'm, you know, I'm really important and this, and she's just, I don't, you know, and, and it again, he just, he doesn't understand. He doesn't understand the way people relate to each other. He doesn't understand that when, when he can pay for a woman to come up to his apartment and specify her hair color and such, it doesn't mean that she cares about him. She, he thinks that she should because he's important. He's rich, so he can have any, any woman he wants, and that woman is supposed to be impressed, but she's not... She's not there for that. He's he's acting as if he's taking a, a girl out for a date or something, you know. And yeah, and and then at the same time, if she asks or says something that makes him feel like, you know, like he's maybe not the biggest deal in the world, then he's immediately insulted. Even if it was clearly she was trying to be nice and such. And the. Yeah, he, he gets enraged when someone outdoes him at success, or rather, seeming successful. Because again, it's it's all status symbols in this. There's no one who, you know, there's there's almost no mention even of work, of what they do, or like there's there's a little bit about someone just got that client or just, you know made a really big, you know, there's almost nothing like that. It, it doesn't feel like they are working. It feels like they are, like, too important to even do work and just bored, you know. And the, you know, characters will openly insult the less successful. There's one scene where some characters are at a restaurant and one of the characters says, this isn't Dorcia. Can uh, this place is empty? This is not. This is 
this is too small a place for me. And he doesn't even care what they, like, have to, you know, the, the waiter comes up and, like, you know, like they will on, on expensive restaurants, you know, says, you know, the, our special tonight is this and that. And he's, he interrupts and says, I don't, I don't care, you know, because this, what, what is this? Why am I here? Why am I in a place that isn't up to my standards. This is ridiculous. And it's just, again, it's it's beyond rude. It's just, he's he's making, he's almost making a scene, you know, and, and just, and this is, yeah, I, I can't believe that there's, you know, it's, it's, again, it's as like, like, if, if you or I were like being, yeah, let's let's say that we had to drive, you know, we had to partake in a road trip or something, and we were, you know, I'm the driver, and someone comes up to me and says, this is our car. And I look at it, and I can tell this thing is going to fall apart any second. Then, you know, you say, no, no, this is, this is ridiculous. We have to do better than that. You know, but just you're at a restaurant, and it's not, you don't feel, again, it's not, or he's reacting like he found out that they, like he took a bite, and there was some, you know, or he cut open the food, and there was like something in there or something. No, 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 this is still, it's a fancy place. It's just not fancy enough for his taste, and he's like, there are hardly any people here because there are so many of these fancy restaurants that if you're not the biggest deal, then there might not be that many people at it. You know, that isn't, that doesn't mean that it's not a good restaurant and you shouldn't openly insult. And and again, the, the staff just take this. Again, the waiter, you know, you'd feel like he should be able to say, fine, jerk, you know, here's the menu. I don't have to take this, but he does. And so he just keeps going, and there's there's like this thing of, okay, yes sir, yes sir, we yes, and you know there are a lot of platitudes. There's this there's this scene where a woman I don't want to give a, everything away, but just yeah, there's there's a she. Yeah, all, all I will say is that she asks the this guy, you know, will will you call me before Easter? And he's like, eh, I don't know, maybe. And you know, they have some more conversation, and it seems like they're almost kind of they're talking at each other. They're saying things. They're not saying nonsense. They're saying things. And then she says, "If I don't see you before Easter, have a nice one." And, and it's like, yeah, it's it's like like she just watched something on the Hallmark Channel or something. She she's like, nice, uh, have have a nice time. It's like she's she's trying out these words. It's like a, a robot that's just trying to process how do people talk. What is there's a there's a vacation kind of thing coming up. Have a nice one. That's what people are supposed to say. It's it's completely disconnected from the 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 rest of and yeah. And there are scenes where you know characters will just storm out and like they you know the others might react but they're not gonna like stop them and say you. What, are you gonna go do something you're gonna regret, or is is everything okay? It's just fine. Okay, I guess he's gonna go. And the I suppose. And there is this very distinct sense that if you have enough money, you can get someone to do whatever you want them to, even if they don't, you know, even if you have a bad feeling about it, even if everything inside of you screams, this is wrong, you know, because money, you know, and, and that really shows it's not just this upper class. It's not just, you know, it's also people who just don't 
already have a lot of money that you know if they see a lot of money they it, it overrides their their instincts they 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 know they shouldn't do this but that's that's a lot of money and and you know to of course you to an extent you know it's expensive to live it's especially expensive to be poor so yeah you you want to be able to i guess i could yeah it's a it's it's a prostitute in the specific scene but but yeah you know it's a and it makes sense that that you know you want money, and if it seems like you can get a lot without necessarily having to do an awful lot for it, yeah, but it it really, it's a, it's a great image of just this, and in, in that case, maybe not so much greed, but consumerism that, that, and capitalism, the, the fact that if someone waves enough money in our face, suddenly, you know, everything inside of screaming no can be deafened by our lips saying yes. And that was way more poetic than I meant it to, but yeah. Please comment, thumbs up, and subscribe for more content.